In today's conventional warfare, air superiority is vital to armies and navies. Aircraft, missiles and airborne troops wage war from the skies. The origins of aerial warfare can be found in the ancient world. Extraordinary kite bombers soared over ancient cities. Rocket-powered missiles preyed on enemy ships from the air. Ancient ballistics experts created the first land-to-sea missiles that skirted the waves and smashed into enemy hulls. And at an altitude of 6,000 feet, this ancient discovery's paratrooper trusts a replica of a 500-year-old parachute with his life. Airborne assault is our ancient discovery. The medieval city was more than just a dwelling place. It was a fortress defended by monumental walls and towers. Some, like the great city of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, had a series of walls and ditches. Others had single walls so massive they still stand after thousands of years. Attacking a well-defended city was a long and difficult process. Every tactical or engineering advantage was explored and exploited. Some ancient military innovators dreamed of attacking enemy fortifications from the sky. Here in the library of Christchurch College in Oxford lies a 700-year-old book that reveals an extraordinary airborne assault weapon, the kite bomb. This is the first image of a kite in Europe being used as a, an engine of war. In 1327, this book was a coronation gift to the 14-year-old King Edward III of England from his tutor. It had two functions, really. First, it was to excite the imagination of the king, and this was a manual, effectively. The, the whole book was telling him how to be a king. Ancient weapons expert Mike Lodes is eager to determine whether the kite bomb could really have flown. He aims to build one and drop bombs from the sky, as may have been done 700 years ago. He's come to Oxford to examine the original manuscript. It's got boys' toys and yeah. machines, and what could be more exciting yes. than flying a kite and dropping a bomb? Absolutely. I think that must have been... <laughs> this is almost the last illustration, and I think this must have been... When he, when he opened this, he must have laughed. I mean, to thought, a, this is great fun. Is this complete fantasy? This possibly came out of the Crusades. Possibly he's been talking to old soldiers who said, well, there's a siege machine like this, and this is not at all fanciful. There's some evidence that kites were used in warfare in the ancient East and the Middle Eastern empires of the ancient world had long mastered the art of explosives. European crusader armies returning from the Holy Land brought back more than just gold and treasure. They also returned with ideas, the technology of the Arabs, the trebuchet, cannon, gunpowder, and as Mike and Justin suggest, the kite bomb. Could it have worked, do we think? Well, this particular engine, I, I, I think, is very practical, and it, it essentially is a kite. It's a very large kite. It's holding, as we can see, some kind of device, which may be a bomb. The bomb would have been an incendiary device filled with naphtha or Greek fire, a highly flammable petrochemical substance known to the ancients. Like many petrol-based weapons, it was very hard to extinguish, even with water. They would often fling it at castles in great slings and trebuchets and things in earthenware pots. So it would seem to me that's very likely yeah. an earthenware pot. But, of course, you wouldn't actually want to burn a town down, would you? Well, think? no, it's the last thing you want to do is destroy the town. You want to take it and keep it. So, uh, largely, this is to frighten the inhabitants of the town into giving up the keys. Many mysteries persist surrounding the kite bomb. Why are there three men holding it? And what is the large, spool-like device they're standing next to? The best way to find out whether the kite and its firebomb would have worked is to build one and test it. Armed with his research, Mike has assembled a team of experts to reconstruct the weapon. My imagination has just been racing, and one can only imagine that the young Edward III's imagination must have raced as well. I bet he tried it. I bet he got some men to try it. But we're certainly going to try it. I really think it's anybody's guess if this thing is going to work. I mean, certainly, in 1327, this was just the most astonishing concept of dropping a bomb from the sky. Based on their knowledge of medieval technology, Mike's team has recreated in detail the world's first aerial siege weapon. 
what I love about what you've done here is you've filled in the 3D bit, because all we've got in the picture is this two-dimensional post. It's obviously there for a function. We know the three men involved, and we, see, we can get sort of correlate how much power they're going to be generating. So, I mean, we can get some idea of how substantial the whole thing needs to be. Because I think that's what the artist is doing with the picture. With his three men straining, he's saying this is an incredibly powerful I weapon. Think... And look, he's trying to sell yeah. the power of the thing with the props, with the men, and with this. Martin Lester is a specialist kite maker. What I love about this is it looks exactly the same as the one in the glory. What sort of surface area have we got here? It's about 30 square feet. It's about seven foot high, five foot wide. The cloth for the ancient kite would have been silk and the wooden struts willow. The thing about using wood and silk is that there's no guarantee that everything will flex the same amount. You need a long tail to help stabilise it and counteract any imbalance in the head of the kite. I'd quite like to see it up there. Let's do that now. What do we have to do? Well, I've got the line tied on. If you were wanting to lift a payload of explosives above a tower, is this a design you'd choose? It is. I mean, you want a, a nice steady kite, something that's not going to chase around all over the place with the wind. Well, um, it, is a, it is a very well-behaved kite. And with the long, it's being obedient. Well, the long tail just helps steady the whole kite. I that's, mean, that's um, the deal of the tail. Hundreds of years before the invention of modern aeroplanes, it was known that all aerodynamically stable devices require a tail. It's relatively easy to produce lift, but such lift must be balanced by the weight and drag of a tail. The two forces act against each other, but in unison, to give balance. And it makes it look really spectacular too. Yeah. So, is this, do you think, just, just a spool to wind it in when we finish, or could it serve some function? Well, it's, I mean, if, if the wind's pulling really hard, you're not going to be able to hold this by, you know, a couple of people wouldn't be able to hold this, so you'd need a capstan which takes all the main pull, and then you need little, t you don't need so much tension on this side. If it was going 20 miles an hour, I wouldn't be able to control this by myself. The weather turns and it begins to rain, but Mike and the group continue with their experiment. What looks like a double string in the original illustration has led Mike to believe that the ancient kite bombers may have threaded a second string through a brass ring on the kite. This second string would have hauled the bomb up to arm the device. The bomb casing is made of earthenware. It contains four pints of flammable agent with a total weight of five pounds. Though kites can fly in the rain, there's one weather condition that will defeat every kite on Earth. The wind's just dropping too much here for us to be able to do this at the moment. And this obviously would be the frustration <laughs> that kites are completely dependent on wind. It seems almost moments ago that this magnificent dragon was right above our heads and its angry tail thrashing with menace. And now look at it. Clearly, if we were on a battlefield, kites are not great because the army will have gone home before we can use it. But on a city, well, you can just wait for a windy day and we're going to hope this wind picks up. At last, as the light fades, the wind returns and the kite bomb can be armed. The illustration suggests the young king and his men would have threaded the second string through the brass ring and hauled the bomb skywards. Then they would have walked the kite over enemy city walls. The release mechanism of this complex machine is a simple blade. The string is cut. The rest comes down to gravity. have got wet, burning sand. It's a light on a wet beach, so this is really going to take out a town. You imagine a medieval town with all its thatch and its wooden buildings. Our kite works, our bomb works, our targeting is good. This would be a terrible terror weapon. The kite could have held an entire city to ransom as the shocked inhabitants recoiled in horror. Whether the kite bomb was ever used in warfare is not recorded. But this ancient airborne assault weapon certainly was. It was designed to attack not cities, but ships, and was one of the most successful weapons in an important war. Its secret? It bounced its deadly cannonballs over water, straight into the hulls of enemy ships.
1452, the Turkish Sultan Mehmet II prepared to lay siege to the great city of Constantinople. Protected by 14 miles of walls, 15 foot wide, the city was thought by many to be unconquerable. This only made the Sultan want it more. His father had besieged the city, his grandfather had besieged the city, all his ancestors had been trying to take Constantinople. He wished to be the Sultan who achieved this great feat. In order to succeed where so many had failed, Mehmet realized he needed to weaken the city by cutting off its supplies. This meant severing its major supply route, the Bosphorus. Constantinople is situated with ideal connections by sea to the Mediterranean, to the Black Sea. So its water routes were vital to its prosperity and vital to its security too. Mehmet immediately put his plan into action. He decides to build a major fortification to cut shipping up and down the Bosphorus. At the channel's narrowest point, he built a castle called Rumeli Hisar, opposite the older Turkish fort of Andalu Hisar. Together, the two fortresses could control all traffic through the strait. To prevent ships passing through, Mehmet relied on his cannon. A familiar sight on the battlefields of medieval Europe, the cannon was a powerful weapon that could fire a stone ball up to 3,000 feet. The heavy artillery at Rumeli Hisar was placed right down by the waterside to fire flat trajectory across the strait. The rest of the castle is really the landward defence and the supply base for those vital artillery pieces. Rumeli Hisar was the world's first fortified gun battery, but there was a problem. Sinking a 100-foot ship with a cannonball from a distance is harder than it sounds. Traditionally, the only way to increase range was by firing up in an arc. If you shoot up in the air, uh, the, the point at which it comes down is the only chance you get to hit the ship. And it makes it very likely to hit it on top of the deck and not hit it at the waterline, which is going to make it sink. A clue to how the Turkish gunners may have solved this problem lies in a mysterious eyewitness account. The document describes the balls being fired in a way never seen before. They hurled immense round stones that went along the surface of the seas as though they were swimming. Some believe this is evidence the Turks discovered the art of ricochet. This modern ballistics tactic was employed by the RAF in the Second World War, dropping bombs in such a way that they skipped across the water and destroyed Nazi dams. The tactical advantage that you get from bouncing cannonballs is that you can hit ships with good reliability at extra range. If you can bounce it, you can go a long, a long distance and hit the ship on the side, maybe near the waterline, and you're very likely to cause a cataclysmic injury. But could the Turks really have pioneered this destructive tactic 500 years earlier than previously thought? At an army testing range in Denmark, physicist Michael de Podesta and artillery expert Peter Vemming are finding out. The key thing that would have made it novel was the speed with which you could project such a large thing. That's unique to gunpowder. You, you can't do it any other way. The, the next thing is you need is a low angle. If you're lobbing it up in the air and lobbing it down, that, that will never work. You've got to be low to the water, good, fast initial trajectory. To investigate this principle, Michael and Peter use a replica cannon from the same era as Mehmet's bombards. The ball hits the water at 300 feet per second and bounces first time. A closer look at the physics shows how the water repels the ball. First of all, if we look at why critical speed is important, if we take the ball and try and move it through the water, we can see that at a low speed, the particles of water, the molecules are moving around and they're getting out of the way of the, the sphere and they're flowing around it. And if we increase our speed to beyond the critical speed, we'll find that the water effectively acts as a solid and that if we hit it fast enough, the ball can't penetrate it at all. The ball continues on its path, bouncing five times over 1,000 feet. If we zoom in and take a look at what's happening at the contact point, we see that the cannonball has scored a, a long trench in the water and the water's piling up in front of it. And at the last point of contact here, we're going to have forces acting on it. One component of the force is going to be a drag, which is acting this way. That's going to slow the cannonball down. But we have another factor, which is the upwards force, which is called lift. And if that force is great enough, it will actually throw the ball out of the water and we can see it carrying on its journey here. 
and that will allow it to, to carry on and potentially make further bounces further on down the water. The ball may have bounced, but it didn't hit the target. Any ship would have sailed away to safety. This calls for a recalculation of the elevation of the cannon. They had fine directional stability, yep. but it went too high, yeah, 20 yeah, yeah, more yeah. meters above, and then it went down and bounced. Be uh, beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful shot, but so we have to correct it now, get it a, maybe half a, half a degree half down. Half a degree down? Yeah. I think down a little bit. A little down bit, but not much. Bit. Not yeah, much. Yeah. Once adjusted, the cannon is fired again. Once again, the ball can be clearly seen bouncing across the surface of the water. This time, it smashes into the target, driving a six-inch hole through the solid wood. That was amazing and a bit lucky. What do you say? Oh, okay. yeah. Just down at the bottom right there? Yeah, it went to the right and it had a hit of the water in front of the target and then it yeah, bounced five or six times. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite amazing. Yeah. Our investigation has proved that it is possible to bounce cannonballs across water and hit a target. It must definitely have been able to do this. this it's just completely... It's taken us a few shots to get it right, but it's definitely... They must have been able to do this. On the Bosphorus, this tactic was soon put to the test. On the 25th of November, 1452, just three months after the fortress of Rumeli Hisar was completed, a Venetian trading ship refused orders to stop and was fired upon. So if you can imagine what, what you would actually see if you were on a ship and someone had fired this towards you, it would take many, many seconds for the... Uh, you'd, you'd see the flash of the cannon, you, a few, little while later you'd hear the bang, and then you'd see perhaps a few dots on the water, and then bang, there'd be a hole in your ship. The ship was sunk and its 30-man crew executed. From then on, it was clear that the Turks were masters of the Bosphorus. In effect, shipping up and down the Bosphorus became extremely dangerous, and you risked your life if you were trying to pilot a ship uh, through that uh, throat cutter, as it was called. Uh, it really was a, a, a stranglehold on shipping. Within a few months, Constantinople was ripe for the taking. In 1453, Mehmet laid siege to the city. Without its principal supply route, the city held out for just eight weeks before falling to the Turkish onslaught. It was a stage in the Ottoman conquest of the known world. They had to capture Constantinople, and once they had, they went on to attack and besiege many other great capitals. Aerial warfare took many forms in the ancient world. From kite bombs to bouncing bombs, each weapon struck fear in the enemy. But some airborne assault weapons took this ambition even further. They were designed to control the whole battle, using only the power of sound. So if you're in the, in the middle of a battle, and then suddenly you hear this high-pitched, whistling, screeching sound, you know from experience that these things are going to be hitting you any second, literally a split second. These arrowheads are unlike any others ever produced. Too large to fly aerodynamically, too blunt to inflict serious injury, these projectiles unlock the secrets of how ancient Chinese battlefield commanders spoke to their troops in the days before radios. The main use of whistling arrows was a signal devices, a sort of early version of the flares that are used on today's battlefields. Ancient China in the second century AD. In the remote reaches of Mongolia lived a nomadic people known as the first Khans of Xiongnu, led by a warrior chief named Miedan. Ancient legends say that Miedan deployed whistling arrows. Few people know more about these arrows than Stephen Selby. He traveled to the farthest reaches of China in his hunt for this legendary device. Remarkably, he discovered an actual whistling arrowhead. This is an original arrowhead. It's about 2,000 years old, and it comes from uh, north of China, probably the area that was occupied by the Xiongnu. And although it's so old and it's made of bronze, uh, it'll probably still whistle quite well. We can have a try. Legends say that Miedan used the piercing sound of whistling arrows to send signals to his troops in the heat of battle. The story goes that Miedan invented the whistling arrow and then he directed his troops to kill whatever the arrow went near. He fired the arrow to his favorite hunting dog. 
Some of the troops went over and killed the dog, but some of them were too afraid. The ones who were afraid were killed. Finally, he fired the arrow to where his father was standing, and all the troops rushed over and killed his father. Miedon swept through southern China. Armed with whistling arrows, he was able to control his troops like a puppet master. For the general on the battlefield, he couldn't be in the thick of the battle. He had to be at a high location overlooking the formations. The stories say that Miedon could send signals to troops up to half a mile away. But could a bronze whistle like the one Stephen found really make enough noise to be heard above the clamor of battle? I've spent a lot of time making pipe organs and making whistles and pipes of various sorts. So this was actually quite an interesting challenge to, to, to work out exactly how these, um, these things operate. And basically, it's like most whistles. We've got a sound chamber. Um, these can be quite small, which will give a very, very high-pitched, shrill sound. The bigger they are, the lower the pitch will be. Richard has been able to work out how the sound is produced. The air is rushing over that hole there. It's hitting an angle, which is this little device we call the fipple. The air is caused to move inside the fipple, causing a build-up of pressure on the inside. Air rushing through the hole in a whistle pressurizes the air in the chamber. This causes the molecules to vibrate rapidly, creating an audible sound. In a whistling arrow, the vibrations are so vigorous that the sound is heard as a high-pitched screech. Could this ingenious application of basic physics produce a loud enough sound to change the tide of battle? At Cranfield Weapons Testing Facility near Swindon, Stephen Selby will put the whistling arrow to the test. He's rigged up a decibel meter to gauge any change in audio level. We've fixed up this sound meter here, and it's on the wall just at the place where the arrow is going to fly past and it will continuously measure the sound, but when it reaches the loudest level of sound, it will just freeze there, and then after the test, we're going to be able to read off what the maximum sound level was. Richard's arrow has produced a loud whistle. This meter here has given a reading of 86 decibels, and I think that that's quite good and loud, and it should have made a pretty good impression on the battlefield. This is over the legal noise limit for motorcycles in Britain and the whole of Europe. But Maidan did not stop at sound. Sometimes what they did was they'd use a whistling arrow, and round this they would wrap cotton or hemp or something of that nature soaked in oil, set fire to it, and then fire the arrow to the point of pressure where the archers needed to fire to. Most military systems have a backup known as redundancy. Thus, Mia Dung complemented the whistle with a visual cue. Fire. I think it would have really made an impression on the battlefield. You could definitely hear that a long way away. And uh, with more time travelling further, I think it would have been a very good signal. Our experiments have shown how these arrows both unnerved the enemy and revolutionised the way troops are commanded in battle. A battlefield is terribly confused. It's terrifying. Even before firearms, there was smoke there would be dust, there would be rain, there would be mist, all sorts of confusing situations. An arrow that flew over with a sound and a smoke signal was a very clear signal compared to anything that was happening at ground level. The whistling arrows were a means of directing troops in battle, but to rain down destruction from the air, ancient commanders had to wait until the invention of gunpowder and the rocket. It was a device that struck fear on the battlefields of medieval China. A winged bird flying at a speed unseen in nature. It was called the Magic Flying Crow. The fact that an explosive charge was carried inside the Flying Crow and was intended to be detonated suggests that it was originally conceived as a weapon of mass destruction. The magic flying crow is described in an extraordinary ancient Chinese text dating from the late 14th century, the Fire Drake Artillery Manual. It is basically the model of a bird, complete with wings and tail, propelled by four rockets. These drive it into the vicinity of the enemy and then ignite an explosive charge inside the device. So it's an early version of a modern artillery rocket. 
were the Chinese the first to develop effective military rockets over 700 years ago. Did they have the technology? Modern rocketeer Ben Jarvis is investigating stories of what could be history's first rocket warheads. He's recreated a magic crow using the precise dimensions and descriptions in the Fire Drake manual. The wings of the crows would have been made out of a lightweight wood such as balsa wood or basswood and uh, they probably would have carved them to give them a slight airfoil. The purpose of this would have been to actually allow the crows to glide for a greater distance after the rocket engines had stopped burning. Ben has unearthed evidence of an aerodynamic design. It's quite impressive that they were actually able to realise the importance of, of having a tail um, in order to aid stability. The ancient Chinese engineers powered their device with a mixture they called fire chemical, that we know as gunpowder. It was the Chinese who originally invented gunpowder. Um, it's, it's actually a fairly simple uh, combination of saltpeter or potassium nitrate mixed with sulfur and charcoal. The Chinese developed an ingenious technique of transforming gunpowder into rocket fuel. This is, this is a simple gunpowder rocket engine. When compressed under high pressure, uh, gunpowder uh, becomes basically like a solid block. Um, and it, it can then be lit and it will burn from one end to the other in a controlled fashion rather than just going bang. Computer scientist James Dean has modelled how this explosive fuel was able to power the ancient Chinese rocket based on the specifications in the Fire Drake manual. Let's take a look at an ancient Chinese rocket and see how it might work. Here you can see there's a body of a rocket and contained within it we've got some solid fuel and the principle is that when we ignite the solid fuel it's going to very rapidly create a lot of gas which has a much higher volume than the solid fuel that we started with so if we take a look back at the wider scale we can see the rocket body and let's see what happens when we ignite the fuel and you can see that it's producing a lot of high pressure inside and so effectively the body is pressing on the gas and ejecting it out the back and because of principle of every action having an equal and opposite reaction, the gas in turn applies a force to the body, which is what accelerates the rocket and makes it travel off in a straight line. This simple principle of physics powered the rocket and its deadly payload. The crows were hollow, made from bamboo, and were probably packed completely full of loose gunpowder, probably in a fairly coarse mixture so that uh, when the fuse from the rocket engines burnt through into it, it would cause a huge fireball to set fire to whatever it was being aimed at. We've done all the work we can. We've built what is hopefully a fairly accurate historical representation of one of these exploding crows. Um, all we can do now is go and see whether or not the, the world's earliest cruise missile ever actually would have worked. Ben Jarvis has teamed up with explosives expert Paul Birch to explore the destructive power of the magic flying crow. We're going to do this first test without the explosive warhead in the crow. The, the main reason is this is a very unusually shaped rocket and anything with wings can uh, inherently be very erratic. So uh, we, before we put explosives on board it, we want to launch one, um, see how it flies, uh, see how far it flies as well, and then make any adjustments before we add that extra level of danger of putting an explosive warhead on the front of it. test flight reveals serious problems with the rocket's structure. It tried to accelerate to like sort of, you know, over 100 miles an hour in less than a second. And I think the aerodynamic forces on the wooden wings and tail were just too much and they just tore off. The ancient Chinese had many, many years um, to earn lots and lots of gunpowder to, to, to experiment with to, to get these things to work. So given that was our first test, it's, it's not surprising that, uh, that it wasn't 100% successful. Ben hopes that less powerful rockets will be more stable. Each engine now holds only half the amount of gunpowder as before. He prepares for a test with a full explosive payload. He set up a 20-foot wide target 140 feet away. We think with these more gentle engines we're now using, we should actually get a, a proper straight flight. With a charge of sort of half a pound of gunpowder, which is roughly what we had in these crows, um, you really wouldn't want it to land anywhere more than 
40, 50 feet away from you, otherwise you'd be in real trouble. Seven centuries after the magic crow was first described, Ancient Discoveries has revealed the devastating truth behind the legend of the flying bird bomb. All the devices we've investigated so far have been distance weapons, but wars are won by men on the ground. No airborne weapon can match the intelligence and versatility of a paratrooper. The airborne assault warrior relies on the parachute to enter the battlefield. Ancient Discoveries delves into the mystery of the first known parachute, with the ultimate test of ancient technology at 6,000 feet. And we'll explore the fundamental principle of the parachute by dropping a man from the sky, holding only an umbrella. British Army skydiver Jay Webster is 6,000 feet above the ground. He's about to leap out of a hot air balloon using just two umbrellas as a parachute. Jay is investigating an ancient Chinese 12th century text known as the Lacquer Table History. It records how a thief escaped from the top of a 140-foot mosque in the city of Canton by using two umbrellas to float to the ground. But is this possible? Three, two, one, see ya! Oh, no. <laughs> After descending 100 feet, Jay is forced to deploy his backup parachute as the umbrellas collapse. <laughs> oh, that was awesome, yeah, it was really good fun. Uh, the umbrellas lasted a, a real lot longer than I thought they would. The main reason the umbrellas worked for 100 feet is because they were able to create drag or air resistance before collapsing under the extreme forces at work during the 120 mile per hour descent. By creating a force opposite to gravity, the umbrellas slowed down Jay's descent. This is the principle that underpins modern round parachutes. It may well have saved the Chinese thief's life when he leapt from the top of the mosque. But this was not man's only attempt to conquer the skies. In 1617, the world's first known successful parachute test was carried out from a four-story building in Venice. The parachute was built by Croatian inventor Faust Veranzio. Hardly anybody's heard of him, um, and it's only now that this has come to light that, um, realistically, I think that um, he, de he deserves a lot more credit. Yet much mystery and intrigue surrounds this extraordinary milestone in man's quest to conquer the skies. Although Varancio left a clearly printed diagram of his parachute, he makes no reference to the materials he used or how they were attached to each other. This has led many researchers to doubt the claim that Varancio was history's first parachutist. The search is on to understand how Varancio could have succeeded where other ancient inventors had failed. The greatest Renaissance inventor and artist of all was Leonardo da Vinci. In the 15th century, Leonardo imagined and sketched what is generally considered to be the first design for a parachute. But there's no evidence that Leonardo ever built or tested his parachute. It simply remains a design confined to the pages of history. A century later, Varancio set out his own design for a parachute, possibly influenced by Leonardo's sketch. Whatever drove him to do it, um, possibly he might have seen somebody jumping from a burning building. Uh, which would have not been a very pleasant sight, and that might have inspired him because there would have been some sort of inspiration to develop this. Uh, so there must have been a need. He wouldn't have designed it and built it and jumped it uh, just for the hell of it, I don't think. I think it would have been a, there would have been a need. Um, and I think that his only experience of people coming from great heights would have been a bad one. So I think that it would have been with a lot of trepidation. Using the illustration, leading skydiver Ray Armstrong and parachute rigger Alex Flint are attempting to recreate and test the Varancio parachute. 
One of the biggest challenges were, was the, the simplicity of the drawing and how small the drawing was that we had to work from, and trying to second guess how it would have been constructed. For example, we knew that, that he jumped it and that he survived, so therefore there were certain things that would have to be, uh, have to be in place. The, the thing would have to remain uh, in one piece by the time he hit the deck. In the 17th century, Varancio would have faced the challenge of finding strong but lightweight materials. Based on the, uh, the sketches that uh, were available from uh, Varancio, uh, we saw that there was a, it was essentially a wooden frame with a fabric covering. The bamboo, we've decided to go with that because it's light and strong and would have certainly been available at the time. For the fabric, the team has decided to use habutai, a type of silk that's lightweight and strong. It's comparable to the silk that would have been available to Barancio in the 17th century. But they need to use a sensible and reasonable interpretation for what the design does not explain. The problem that we'd have is if we were to, to lash it to it, which some people have interpreted that it was just um, almost sewn to the edge, then it would have point loading which would weaken the parachute and potentially it would then start disintegrating uh, during the descent. So a simple thing to do would be just to put a sleeve so that we've, um, we've constructed it so that the poles can then just be fed up into it. So then it spreads the load all the way across the sides of the parachute and the fabric then is, is just decelerating. The wooden frame is, is taking the brunt of it. According to historical sources, Varancio successfully landed his parachute from four stories up, a height of around 200 feet. But if our skydiver is not successful, he could be killed. The solution is to test the parachute at a much higher altitude so our jumper will have time to open a reserve. The goal is to see if the chute lasts the 200 feet necessary to have landed Barancio safely on the ground. The test day dawns. Barancio's parachute has not braved the skies for 400 years. The team works to rig it to the base of a hot air balloon. The balloon will lift the parachute and ray 6,000 feet above the ground into the unknown. There's certain variables that we categorically won't know. I'm, I'm an advanced parachute rigger, and I'm used to using uh, modern technical textiles to produce the best result. Now, uh, this has stretched my understanding of, of materials, and there is going to be things that we just can't have taken into account, i.e., until you've suspended something below a balloon and um, it started moving, we don't know the stresses and strains that are going to be put onto it. Ray's safety will be in the hands of Alex, who's responsible for rigging the parachute to the base of the balloon basket. We haven't had any opportunity to test the equipment, the bamboo canes that uh, form the structure of the parachute. It's a natural material. We know it's strong, but it's difficult to quantify its own strength because it is a natural material. 400 years ago, Varancio had no idea if the parachute would break his fall or disintegrate and send him plunging to his death. There are so many things that could fail. Uh, hopefully we've covered everything. The team's major concern is whether the silken bamboo frame will stand up to the forces of drag. The real test of this parachute is if we can drop and fall for five to ten seconds with it staying intact, then it has been a success because that would have been enough time to slow the descent down so that it would have survived. The most critical part for the team is the initial takeoff. We have to get the balloon off the ground, get the parachute under the balloon and then ray under the parachute. Before every jump, yeah. I do get a bit nervous. Have a good one. The balloon takes 12 minutes to climb to 6,000 feet. If the parachute holds together for 10 seconds after its release, it means Varancio would have survived. The moment of truth has arrived. Okay. Ready? Three, two, one, go! Despite the team's fears that the parachute would disintegrate after 10 seconds, 
It's still intact after descending for a minute. But can Ray safely land the Verancio design? Suddenly, Ray hits a problem. The wind is blowing him away from the drop zone towards a housing development. The parachute is at the mercy of the elements. For his own safety and that of the people on the ground, Ray has no choice but to hit the release and deploy his reserve chute. That was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, it was far more successful than I could ever imagine it was going to be. I was expecting a descent rate of 50 feet a second and it was descending at about 22, 26, which is a, a very, very, very survivable rate of descent. A descent rate of 22 feet per second is comparable to the modern parachutes used by today's skydivers and base jumpers. Like Verancio's parachute, they're shaped more like an aeroplane's wings than the traditional round-style parachute. I was even hauling on some of the ropes to try and distort it, to, uh, to put some input to steer it, and I did actually get some input and started to move it around, um, which I categorically wasn't expecting. Verancio's design acted like an aerofoil during its flight. Not only did it create drag, it also created lift. I was even expecting it to start falling apart in the air, but it didn't. So to have two minutes of descent, um, and it was actually, I've jumped more modern parachutes, round parachutes that weren't, weren't as stable. It was a very, very stable platform with a very good rate of descent. It was excellent. Ancient discoveries have shown that throughout history, military commanders have coveted the destructive power of airborne weaponry. Hundreds of years before modern planes, rockets and paratroopers, ancient engineers endeavoured to take warfare to the air with kites, rockets, arrows and the invention of the parachute. In so doing, they laid the foundations for technology that's enabled man to conquer the skies today. With machines designed to deliver the shock of airborne assault. I can just suggest the kite bomb. Could it have worked, do we think? Well, this particular engine, I, I, I think, is very practical, and it, it essentially is a kite. It's a very large kite. It's holding, as we can see, some kind of device, which may be a bomb. The bomb would have been an incendiary device filled with naphtha or Greek fire, a highly flammable petrochemical substance known to the ancients. Like many petrol-based weapons, it was very hard to extinguish, even with water. They would often fling it at castles in great slings and trebuchets and things in earthenware pots. So it would seem to me that's very likely yeah. an earthenware pot. But of course you wouldn't actually want to burn a town down, would you? Well, think? no, it's the last thing you want to do is destroy the town. You want to take it and keep it. So uh, largely this is to frighten the inhabitants of the town into giving up the keys. Many mysteries persist surrounding the kite bomb. Why are there three men holding it? And what is the large spool-like device they're standing next to? The best way to find out whether the kite and its firebomb would have worked is to build one. In today's conventional warfare, air superiority is vital to armies and navies. Aircraft, missiles and airborne troops wage war from the skies. The origins of aerial warfare can be found in the ancient world. Extraordinary kite bombers soared over ancient cities. Rocket-powered missiles preyed on enemy ships from the air. Ancient ballistics experts created the first land-to-sea missiles that skirted the waves and smashed into enemy hulls. And at an altitude of 6,000 feet, this ancient discovery's paratrooper trusts a replica of a 500-year-old parachute with his life. Airborne assault is our ancient discovery. The medieval city was more than just a dwelling place. It was a fortress defended by monumental walls and towers. Some, like the great city of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, had a series of walls and ditches. Others had single walls so massive they still stand after thousands of years. 
Attacking a well-defended city was a long and difficult process. Every tactical or engineering advantage was explored and exploited. Some ancient military innovators dreamed of attacking enemy fortifications from the sky. Here in the library of Christ Church College in Oxford lies a 700-year-old book that reveals an extraordinary airborne assault weapon, the kite bomb. This is the first image of a kite in Europe being used as a, an engine of war. In 1327, this book was a coronation gift to the 14-year-old King Edward III of England from his tutor. It had two functions, really. First, it was to excite the imagination of the king, and this was a manual, effectively, the, the whole book. One and test it. Armed with his research, Mike has assembled a team of experts to reconstruct the weapon. My imagination has just been racing, and one can only imagine that the young Edward III's imagination must have raced as well. I bet he tried it. I bet he got some men to try it. But we're certainly going to try it. I really think it's anybody's guess if this thing is going to work. I mean, certainly in 1327, this was just the most astonishing concept of dropping a bomb from the sky. Based on their knowledge of medieval technology, Mike's team has recreated in detail the world's first aerial siege weapon. What I love about what you've done here is you've filled in the 3D bit, because all we've got in the picture is this two-dimensional post. It's obviously there for a function. We know the three men involved, and we, see, we can get sort of correlate how much power they're going to be generating. So, I mean, we can get some idea of how substantial the whole thing needs to be. Because I think that's what the artist is doing with the picture. With his three men straining, he's saying this is an incredibly powerful I weapon. And he's trying to sell yeah. the power of the thing with the props. With Look was telling him how to be a king. Ancient weapons expert Mike Lodes is eager to determine whether the kite bomb could really have flown. He aims to build one and drop bombs from the sky as may have been done 700 years ago. He's come to Oxford to examine the original manuscript. It's got boys, toys yeah. and machines and what could be more exciting yes. than flying a kite and dropping a bomb? Absolutely, I think that <laughs> must have been, it's, it's, this it's, is almost the last illustration and I think this must have been, when he, when he opened this, he must have laughed. I mean, to thought, a, this is great fun. Is this complete fantasy? This possibly came out of the Crusades, possibly he's been talking to old soldiers who said, well, there's a siege machine like this and this is not at all fanciful. There's some evidence that kites were used in warfare in the ancient East and the Middle Eastern empires of the ancient world had long mastered the art of explosives. European crusader armies returning from the Holy Land brought back more than just gold and treasure. They also returned with ideas, the technology of the Arabs, the trebuchet, cannon, gunpowder, and as much